My talk is entitled The Need for Action. And uh, for those of us who've been fighting this issue for a long time, or for those of us who've been just recently to the issue, propelled by what happened in Connecticut or whatever, it's very frustrating to see what happens in state capitals, frustrating, to, obviously, to see what doesn't happen in Washington. Um, but I believe there is a, a road that we need to get on that can produce significant action. Um, let me posit a question to all of you. Heidi Heitkamp was a Democratic senator elected uh, in the 2012 election, and she was one of the six Democrats who voted against universal background checks. She voted against universal background checks, notwithstanding the fact that the poll by the largest newspaper in North Dakota found 93% of North Dakotans in favor of universal background checks, including almost seven out of 10 NRA members. Kelly Ayotte is a moderate Republican senator from New Hampshire. She voted against universal background checks, even though a poll by the Manchester Guardian found that 90% of New Hampshireans, including 65, no, I'm sorry, 75% of Republicans favored universal background checks. Now, why in Lord's name would two relatively sane, relatively intelligent senators vote against the wishes of over nine out of 10 of their constituents? Because the NRA and the people who follow the NRA's dictates are single issue voters. They vote on one issue, and that is how you, if you're a legislator or a governor, what your stance was on efforts to curb gun violence. Um, and they can target individuals and make a difference. The reason that it seems ludicrous to me to cast these votes, and the reason it would seem ludicrous to you, doesn't seem ludicrous to them, because they know that, and most politicians are visceral, so on an issue like this, my guess is that Kelly Ayotte and uh, uh, Heidi Heitkamp received well over 1,000 emails and well over two or 3,000 phone calls to their office in the days leading up to the vote from Second Amendment uh, rights people. My guess is they received less than 20% of that from people who wanted them to vote aye on the bill. We tend to be the people who believe that we should have rational gun safety laws we tend not to be single issue voters. And the call for action or the need for action is very simple. We've got to become single issue voters. As much as that might hurt, we've got to become single issue voters. Mayor Bloomberg was criticized roundly by progressives and Democrats when he called for New Yorkers to boycott fundraisers for the six Democrats who voted against universal background checks. And literally, people were saying, well, Mayor Bloomberg's going to try to turn it. His action will help turn the Senate over to conservative Republican uh, leadership. And I said, maybe, but Mayor Bloomberg's message is the right message. There have to be consequences. Heidi Heitkamp believes she can do what she did and suffer no consequences from all of the supporters of Democrats and progressive causes. But she knows that there will be consequences if, in fact, she voted the other way. Same thing with Kelly Ayotte. And we've got to become single-issue voters. No ifs, ands, and buts about it. This has to be the issue that drives us. It can't be an amalgam of issues. Until we become single-issue voters and strike the same fear into elected officials that, that they exist when the NRA opposes them, nothing is going to change. Either that or we need to get a, uh, the law changed so there can be secret ballots. If there was a secret ballot on universal background checks, it would have gotten over 80 votes in the Senate. But our senators are scared. There are a bunch of wusses when it comes to taking difficult action. And we've got to change that. Plain and simple as that. No ifs, ands, and buts about it. It has to happen. Secondly, We've, we've got to try to talk some degree of rationality into the, the legislators, both in state legislatures and in Washington. The NRA is not as powerful as they think. Most of you think that the NRA gives out a whole boatload of money in Washington, right? 
The NRA in the 2012 cycle gave out less than $2 million. There were 147 groups that gave out more money than the NRA. But they give it in targeted ways. And again, it strikes up that fear factor. I was a, a strong gun control advocate when I was mayor of Philadelphia, when I was district attorney of Philadelphia. And when I ran for governor in 19, uh, in, excuse me, in 2002, I ran in the Democratic primary against Bob Casey. The NRA strongly supported Bob Casey. Sent out direct mail, did radio ads. Uh, when I ran for, I won the primary. When I ran for governor in the general election, they supported the Republican candidate. When I ran for re-election as governor, they supported the Republican candidate. Pennsylvania is not a blue state. If you're from out of Pennsylvania and you think about recent presidential elections, you say, well, Pennsylvania is becoming a blue state. Not true, only in presidential elections when there's a mass turnout. In other elections, well, as we meet here today, Pennsylvania has a Republican governor, a Republican state senate, a Republican state house, and one Republican senator. Um, it's very much a purple state. And yet I was reelected over the vociferous and strong opposition of the NRA. I won the primary by 12 percentage points. I won the general first general election by 10 percentage points. I won the second general election by 21 percentage points, in spite of the strong opposition of the NRA in the state that has the second highest NRA membership in the union, only second to Pennsylvania. So what does that tell you about the NRA? First of all, a lot of NRA members don't follow the political line of the NRA, as you can tell from the polls on universal background checks. A lot of NRA members do it because they, they want the magazine and they want the discounts. That's why they join. Simple as that. They aren't apostles of the NRA philosophy. Uh, plus the fact is they see the NRA philosophy change with the wind. They were for universal background checks not very long ago, but that uh, totally changed after Newtown. So we've got to convince our worst politicians to not be afraid that they're not as powerful as you think. But we've got to become single issue voters. That's the start and the finish of it. And we've got to push our own legislative agenda. I thought that the Democrats and the president gave up on other parts of the legislation uh, too easily. Um, the only thing they pushed was universal background checks. I would have liked to have seen them push for the reinstate, reinstatement of the ban on high capacity magazines that was in the assault weapons bill. One reason was because we can prove it works. You know, the NRA is always saying, well, all these people in these mass murders, they, the guns are acquired legally, so none of this stuff would make a difference. In Newtown, the mother purchased the gun. She had every right to purchase the gun. Universal background checks wouldn't have stopped that at all. Well, let's take a look at High Capacity Magazine. You all remember the incident in Tucson where uh, 12 people were injured, seven were killed. Among the people killed was the nine-year-old girl whose sole mistake was she, her hero was not an actress or a sports star. Her hero was Congressman Gabby Giffords, and she wanted to meet her congressman, so she went out to the shopping center, and she was shot dead. Gabby Giffords was almost killed, and um, the fact situation in that case was that Jared Loeffner had a, a 33 bullet magazine in his gun when he opened up and hit 19 people, 14 shots missed. He then took out the magazine that was spent and was reaching for a second magazine, took it out of his back pocket, another 33-shot magazine, when a courageous older woman belted his arm with her pocketbook dislodging the magazine and allowing two guys who were standing nearby to jump him and disarm him and, and, and uh, immobilize him until he was taken into custody. Assume that the assault weapons ban was still in effect, and assume the first magazine that Loeffner put into his gun was 10 bullets, which was the law at the time. He couldn't have hit 19 people. If you assume his accuracy would have been the same, he would have hit six people. So some who were killed would have survived, some who were injured would have not been hit at all. It would have made a dramatic difference. Maybe that nine-year-old girl 
would still be alive today. Because obviously the same fact pattern would have happened. When he finished with the 10 shots, he would have tried to reload. The woman would have done the same thing, and the guys would have done the same thing once it, the second magazine fell to the ground. It makes a difference. And what we need to do is start putting pressure on moderate Democrats and conservative, on moderate Republicans, there are some left, and conservative Democrats. We need to force a vote. Now, with the Republicans in control of the House, you say, and the Speaker decides which bills go to the floor, how can we do that? Well, you might have heard talk in, uh, about immigration about it, something called a discharge petition. We need to send around a discharge petition. Every Democrat should sign the discharge petition, and then it should be taken to the Republicans. And by the way, if a majority of members of the House sign a discharge petition, the bill goes immediately to the floor and is voted on without amendment. So we have four so-called moderate Republican congressmen in this area, Congressman Gerlach in Montgomery County, uh, Congressman Fitzpatrick in Bucks County, Congressman Meehan in Delaware County, and Congressman Dent in the Lehigh Valley. They all were able to say, yes, we, we support universal background checks. They said that in a letter to the newspaper. But they never had to really put up or shut up. If discharge petition, they would have either had to go against their own speaker, go against their own caucus, or sign it. If they sign it, we get it to the floor and we get a vote. And I believe if that bill went to the floor, it would pass. If they don't sign it, then we've got them for what they are, too scared to buck the NRA, too scared to buck their own party. And then we have a shot to remove them in the next election. We've got to be aggressive. We've got to be creative, we've got to be aggressive, and we've got to be single-issue voters. Again, there's no other pathway. It has to be all-out war. We've been fighting this battle with one and maybe one and a half of our arms tied behind our back. We've got to use every arrow in our quiver if we really want to make a dent. And the stakes are, I heard the last speaker talk about the difference uh, in the, the Beretta executive's attitude and about saving lives. The stakes are real. I mean, when I spoke out at Villanova at, at Operation Ceasefire, it sure asked me to speak at Villanova. And the good news was it was in December. I thought we'd have 15, 20 people there. We had 200 people, and every seat in the auditorium was packed. But there was a traveling exhibit that was on display upstairs. It was a portrait that this incredible portrait painter had done of every one of the children who were killed at Newtown. And the portraits were incredible. They looked like photographs. And they were up on the wall, all next to each other, about two-thirds of the It was about as big as two-thirds of the screen. You see that portrait, and you know what the stakes are. We can't hesitate. It's war, and it's a war that we've got to win. And I believe it's a war that we can win, because the American people are behind us in so many different ways. The American people want it to stop. Unfortunately, you know it's likely that there'll be another Newtown, or there'll be another Tucson, or there'll be another Aurora. And then what happens? You know, we've become great at the aftermath of these mass killings. The president or the governor comes out, and there's a ceremony, a ceremony of remembrance, and everyone talks about how great the first responders were. Everyone talks about the bravery of the teachers and, or, or the people who were involved in trying to help. And the president gives a great speech. And we all engage in prayer. And nothing changes until the next incident. And then we have another ceremony. And I don't know about you, but I'm sick of it. Thank you. You can go into a gun store, and if you pass your background check, you leave with a gun. There's no license. There's no registration. There's no training. There's no waiting period. There's no limit on what you can buy or how much you can buy. Ammunition is virtually unregulated, um, except for Philadelphia, which is a little bit of a special case. Uh, we are an open carry state, um, concealed carry with a permit that you can get either from uh, the county sheriff or, if you live in Philadelphia, from the Philadelphia Police Department. Um, we have had some progress 
in the year since Newtown. Pennsylvania went from being among the worst states in the nation in terms of getting our mental health records into the national database to one of the best. That happened just over a year ago with little fanfare from the state police and governor's office that made it happen, uh, but to much attention from organizations like mine and many of the ones up here. Um, we knew that was a big deal for Pennsylvania to go and share 642,000 men missing mental health records. Also last year, uh, our new Attorney General, Kathleen Kane, made it clear that if you want to carry a concealed weapon in Pennsylvania and you are a Pennsylvania resident, you need to get a permit here. You cannot go to Florida, go online to Florida or Virginia or somewhere else and get one. That's another big step. And also, uh, and Governor Rendell spent a lot of time talking about this, um, both of Pennsylvania senators supported uh, the background check bill. And not only did they support it, but Senator Toomey put his name on it. That is tr a tremendously huge deal here in Pennsylvania, not something that would have been expected to happen. So we've had some progress. We are not one of the states that has been passing bad laws since Newtown, nor have we passed our agenda, which is a broad agenda to expand background checks and close our private seller loophole, which applies to long guns here, to get a statewide lost or stolen reporting requirement, to have a limit on capac high capacity magazines, and to fight uh, the restrictive preemption laws that harness what state, towns and municipalities can do. So we have a lot to do, uh, but we also have uh, things to be hopeful for. And as the governor mentioned, he talked about the federal elections, but we have a lot of people right now who would like to be your new governor, who would like to be your new representative in Harrisburg or Washington, and you should be asking them where they stand on this. Uh, Ceasefire PA is doing some of that, and we'll soon be issuing a report about the, uh, the candidates running for governor. Um, but we encourage you to be sending those emails, sending those letters. Uh, earlier this week, we sent, and many of you got it, an email asking you to write again to your legislator about expanding background checks, and hundreds of you already have. So we need to keep up that pressure. We know that we are a majority. We have been silent for too long, but we know that's changing too. So that's a little bit of overview of what's happening in Pennsylvania. I'm gonna go down and ask each of the panelists to talk, and then hopefully we'll get to talk to each other. I'm going to start with uh, Deputy Commissioner Bethel from the Philadelphia Police Department. Um, and can you tell us, sir, uh, there's some good news in Philadelphia, right? Oh, it's all good news, all good news. Well, good evening, well, early evening. Um, so just to give you an overview, I mean, uh, Philadelphia, uh, we, we've really had a, a successful year, despite the, the issues that we have with the, the, the gun laws and how we wish they would be. Uh, we, we feel confident that our strategies and, and our, our efforts are, uh, to uh, abate the violence is, is working. Uh, now is my boss, Commissioner Ross, is in the back, uh, and so uh, he's in the back there with me. Um, so last year we had probably one of our best years uh, that we've had since 1967. Uh, we had 247 uh, homicides, and many of you may say, wow, 247 is a lot. And my friend to the left would, would tell you that definitely that is a lot. Um, but considering how uh, in the 90s and early 90s, 1990, we had 500 homicides. I was just talking to Brian earlier, you know, in 1960 it was 125, 130. And so we've made some significant strides uh, since uh, Commissioner Ramsey and Commissioner Ross and, and, and the team has really put forth a lot of effort uh, to reduce the level of violence that we see in the city. Just to give you a kind of overview of what the city looks like, we have uh, 21 uh, patrol districts, six divisions, and each one of those uh, areas, in, in, uh, we have 12 districts that experience a significant level of violence, uh, gun violence in particular. And of those 12, six of those districts uh, are run uh, roughly over 50% of our violence occurs in there. And, and so gun violence is the, is the premium focus uh, where we spend a lot of our time and energy, unfortunately, uh, trying to address these, these various pockets of violence uh, across the city. But again, we emphasize that we've, we've had an amount of success. Last year we had uh, uh, our lowest number of uh, shooting victims that we've had since we've been recording that number. Um, but we also deal with a lot of uh, gun uh, violence as it relates to confiscations. Last year we confiscated over 3,800 guns uh, in the city of Philadelphia, and that's one of our lowest years. So you see the sheer volume of guns that comes into the city uh, is an enormous. But we've also been successful across our violent crime uh, overall, and, and, and we've seen a reduction in, in our robberies of 26%. And I'm comparing that to 2007. You know, in 2008, Commissioner Ramsey came on board. Uh, burglaries have been down, vehicle thefts 47%. And we use, uh, again, a myriad of strategies to do that. Uh, you know, working, uh, Brian, we work together. He's no longer in the DA's office in a program down in South Philadelphia. Uh, using a David Kennedy model and, and focusing in that area on the gang violence. 
Uh, we use a number of footbeat uh, deployments, uh, some old school uh, deployment that goes back, but we're working with Temple University and, and studying our analysis of that. We've really worked hard to use that, that strategy. We focus on around 38 targeted areas, so when I talk to you about violence, uh, we have 38 areas that we target specifically uh, because of their increased level of violence, and we put a lot of manpower and, and time into those pockets. Uh, and, and we work with a number of our support groups uh, out there, mothers and charges I see down to my left, uh, and we work a lot together. And, and I'll, I'll give her her, 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 uh, her props here as we sit here because the, all too often the groups that you'll talk about and the groups that we see on the ground, uh, their numbers are not counted. But we definitely believe that the work and the, and the success we've had in those reductions have come from their efforts on the ground, doing the stuff up in the prisons, talking to these young men and, 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 and trying to get them to, to, to lessen their level of violence and, and get rid of the guns. Uh, but the gun violence continues to be a, a significant process for us. Uh, but we feel we have a very strong strategy under the direction of Commissioner Ramsey. Uh, and, and his position has always been that, you know, and I think uh, Governor Brindell touched on that, the banning of the military-style assault weapons, uh, the limiting of those guns, the high-capacity magazines, uh, uh, closing the gun uh, show loopholes. Uh, all those things are relevant. I mean, we, we're getting guns on the street now that are six, five and six years old, so we're not even getting the new guns. So even if we were to stop today and say you can no longer have a gun, it would take a, a number of years before those guns would ever be given to flush out of the system. Uh, so you see what we're able to do with just our efforts. I can only imagine if we had the gun laws, you know, people talk about New York and, and things that are going on around us. If we had those stricter gun laws, I, I can only imagine where we would be. Born and raised in the city of Philadelphia. I'm 50 years old. I've lived here my whole life. I've been, I've grown up in one of the toughest neighborhoods in the city and seen so much violence. Uh, it's, it's a, and myself and Commissioner Ross will tell you, we, we take a lot of pride in being able to see the number we see, but that number is still too great. And, and we want, oftentimes wonder what would the, if policies were in place and, and people sat down and really, really understood the dynamics that we deal with on a daily basis, of uh, what those gun laws and what those restrictions would do. And we are working with the DA's office and we're doing a, a much better job of keeping these individuals who do carry the guns uh, in custody. But that's a temporary fix, and all too often, you know, these guys come back out or they get other people to take on that process. But, you know, I could only imagine, and hopefully in my career, uh, that we would find uh, an ability to be able to marriage up our, our strategies, what we think are a strong strategy, uh, with the gun laws that would help us to have an effective strategy overall and globally, uh, that we would really, really make a difference in this city. So, so I applaud the efforts that are underway, and I also applaud the panelists who are here who are working to, to, in that effort. Well, thank you. And, and last year, and maybe John Lowy re remembers, uh, we were on a panel together with Commissioner Ramsey, and he was asked about lost or stolen reporting. And, and I always like to quote him because he said, just report the damn gun missing. It helps. So, you know, we have a great partnership with the fo police department. And I want to turn it over to Brian Lenz, who's, who's next to Deputy Commissioner. He's a former chief of the Philadelphia Regional Gun, Bal Gun Violence Task Force. Yeah, I want, to, I want to emphasize former. I see I, I'm being identified that way. I don't want to get arrested for impersonating a law enforcement officer. <laughs> uh, but no, I did have the uh, distinct honor of working with uh, Commissioner Bethel and Commissioner Ross and what they have done uh, in the recent past, but also over their careers is nothing short of miraculous. Um, and with the folks' deterrence, but also just their, their overall uh, strategic uh, vision and, and execution of policing where they're under-resourced and uh, really are hindered by what you heard about the uh, Philadelphia, or Pennsylvania gun laws. Uh, I sp uh, spent a short stint in the uh, Pennsylvania legislature and any time a gun issue would come up uh, after they said no, the next thing the NRA would say is you just have to enforce the laws on the books. Uh, and that for people like uh, Commissioner Bethel and Commissioner Ross, who spent their careers, you know, chasing bad guys down uh, dark alleys, uh, is pretty infuriating when you think about it, because they spend their days 24/7 enforcing the laws that exist. Uh, so the NRA, as to the police, had no leg to stand on when they said enforce the laws that they exist. They did have a leg to stand on in the courtroom, uh, because for many years, uh, in Pennsylvania and in Philadelphia, carrying a gun illegally was a misdemeanor offense, which, as, like in most states, a misdemeanor offense is the second lowest offense. Uh, when I began as a prosecutor in 1993, it was a misdemeanor. It was ha handled by the municipal court, which is a, our, our local uh, misdemeanor court in the city of Philadelphia. 
And if you were if you were successful in getting a conviction for someone carrying a gun, and then you pounded the table and talked about what a terrible person they were, and the judge sentenced them to prison, they had an automatic right to appeal to the Court of Common Pleas. So they got a new trial. So judges had no incentive after convicting someone to give them jail time because the it would just mean a new trial, they would go to the common pleas level, and they would get probation. And that was the situation during the time, uh, as Commissioner Bethel referenced, when there were 500 murders in the city of Philadelphia. 500 murders, but if you got caught carrying an illegal gun, you got out on bail, and when, when and if you got convicted, in 99% of the cases, you got probation. And that's, uh, talk about tying the police's hands behind their back. That awful situation continued up until uh, I think 1997, they changed it to a felony. But when they changed carrying a gun to a felony, they didn't change the sentencing guidelines to call for prison. So now it was a felony, so now you, you, they didn't get that two bites at the apple, they went right to the common pleas court. But at the end of the day, when, the, when you stood in front of the judge and if it was the first offense and they were carrying an illegal gun, the guidelines, the sentencing guidelines suggested probation. Uh, so now you had one step for, uh, forward, you'd gotten the, the, the more serious offense, but still the officer risking his life pursuing the armed uh, offender was not getting a jail sentence or, or in most cases any jail time because they were making bail. Then finally in 2005 they changed the guidelines uh, to call for uh, 12 months in prison if you get caught carrying an illegal gun. But that typically was not being enforced. And so one of the uh, initiatives that was started with the help of Ceasefire Pennsylvania was the Court Watch program uh, where the uh, sentencing in a possession only case, not a robbery, not a shooting, not a homicide, but the sentencing in a possession only case was treated as seriously as a sentencing in those other types of cases. And uh, that meant having Ceasefire represented, but also having ce Ceasefire recruit people from the community to come to the courtroom. Uh, a, a reporter from the Philadelphia Inquirer, Karen Heller, wrote about one of the sentencings and she described that a gun possession sentencing was typically like a wedding where the groom had no guest and the bride had a, a full, a full uh, you know, eight rows of guests. The groom was the prosecutor uh, and, the, and the bride was the defendant. So the prosecutor would stand up and say he had an illegal gun uh, and you know, he's a danger and police officer was put at risk, and then the, you know, the minister, the, the, uh, the, the, the coach, the, the teacher, the mother, the, the cousin, et cetera, would get up and cry and say he's a good boy, let him go home, and you would get probation. So the point of the court watch program was to, sh was to switch that dynamic. So after, uh, not only did you have the, the, vic the defendant represented there, you had someone standing up and saying, look, I wasn't robbed, I wasn't shot, but I live in the community. Uh, my children can't play on the street uh, because there are gunfire a after dark. Uh, I have to have metal uh, on my porch because I'm worried about stray bullets. Uh, my, we live in fear because of guns. This guy was carrying a gun illegally in our community, in the city of Philadelphia. Uh, and that is something that legally the judge has to consider. The judge has to consider the, the interest of the public in sentencing. And we found that uh, that had a, an impact on the sentences we were getting. Uh, th that in conjunction with getting higher bail for a gun arrest led to more people spending time in jail as a result of getting caught with a gun. And I, I think has had uh, some, some positive impact, if for no other reason it had a, a, maybe a good impact for the morale of the police officers so that when they, again, risk their lives to arrest someone carrying a gun, that person's not back out on the corner uh, 24 hours later. Whether it's 30 days, 60 days, or a year, it creates a, de a deterrent that did not exist before in the city of Philadelphia for carrying a gun. And that's been a huge uh, program that Ceasefire has done and, and brought the community into a partnership with the, with the district attorney's office and the police in getting those uh, uh, better results. And getting back to the beginning, it gives us a, a something to throw back at the NRA when they say we don't need any other laws, just enforce the ones. We are enforcing the ones that exist. And it is not enough. Uh, and there are plenty of common sense ideas that would make it uh, better. So take that argument off the table about enforce the, the ones that exist.
Great, thank you. Um, I, I wanted Brian to be here to talk about how the, there can be this private-public partnership that we can work together, not just on policy, but on, on ways to take a stand, empower the community, and have an effect. Um, if you're interested in Ceasefire, let us know. We've brought it to Allegheny County. We'd love to bring it to other counties. It really does give people a chance to kind of take back their neighborhoods, to let judges and defense counsel and defendants and other people in the community know that it is no joke to carry a gun anymore in the city of Philadelphia. Um, Brian Miller is, uh, has been a leader in the movement for a long time. He is a predecessor of mine at Ceasefire PA. He was at Ceasefire New Jersey, and now he is the executive director of Heeding God's Call, and he's gonna talk to us about uh, partnership with the faith community, and I, I think as you'll hear as we go through that, that this is a, a joint coalition effort, and we're all you know, so glad to be working together. Indeed. <clears throat> Hi, folks. I've been doing this for a long time, almost 20 years. My brother was killed in 94 as an FBI agent working at a desk in D.C. police headquarters when a man walked in with an assault pistol, opened the door and opened fire and killed three law enforcement officers and Mike was the first to die. I've been doing this for 20 years and I'm tired of coming to these forums and educating folks, which is important. But I think we need to do more than we've done. And Governor Rendell said that earlier, but I actually think we need to do more than Governor Rendell says. I think we need a national social movement for change. All the people, so many people in this country want change about guns. They have begun to understand that we have it different in the United, differently in the United States than the rest of the world, and we're tired of it. And we've been depending upon politicians to change things, and they've refused to do it. I think just as we change slavery and civil rights and so many other things, we need to, to bond together and force change in a major way. And we at Heeding God's Call, you might have noticed it sounds like a faith-based group, and it is. We believe that the faith community can lead that change, as it has in almost every other social movement in the United States. So that we're trying, at Heeding God's Call, in perhaps a small way in the beginning, to spark that change, to bring people out of the churches, out of the synagogues, out of the mosques, and into the street for action, for activism, for demanding change. And we do it by focusing local effort. And that's where the people are. That's where we need to bring them out. We started by focusing our attention on gun shops. You've heard a lot today about illegal guns. The fact is, the first time a gun is sold in the United States, it's sold by a gun retailer. Most of them are, and you heard John Lowy mention this, the bulk of them are good people. They see two people come in together to make a straw purchase, because that's typically how it's done. A trafficker comes in with his straw buyer, usually a man and a woman, and they're gonna buy guns to put on the street. Most gun dealers see that coming up and they're gonna say, nope, I'm not selling you a gun, and I'm not, in Pennsylvania, I'm not selling you the 10 guns you wanna buy. But some of them are willing to do it. Some of them are willing to take blood money to do it. And what we do at Heeding God's Call is we go talk to those gun dealers, we try to persuade them to adopt a code of conduct that Mayors Against Illegal Guns developed, and we seek to get them to act as good citizens and stop, stop selling and stop making blood money. The first place we went, not far from here, on Spring Garden Street, Colosimo's Gun Center, worst gun shop in, in Philadelphia, counted for 20% of guns recovered from crime. You heard the commissioner talk about how many guns that w are recovered in the city. It's an amazing number of guns, and this one gun dealer was doing that. We talked to Mr. Colosimo, tried to convince him to adopt the code, and he said no. So we started doing once a week what we call witnesses in front of the gun shop. Sometimes we had 75 people there, sometimes we had five people there, but we're there for an hour during drive time, talking to people, there's a stoplight right there, so we had plenty of opportunities to talk to people, singing, praying, holding up our signs, educating people about gun trafficking and how it works and how it's a it's very easy to understand if you hear about it. And after nine months of doing that and Mr. Colosimo claiming he would never sell to a, to a straw buyer, federal authorities then shuttered that gun shop and it's not been open since. Now it's a bike shop. I really like that. 
So we're at two other gun shops in, in northeast Philadelphia. We're at a gun shop at, right outside of Washington, D.C. No gun shops in D.C., so this one you can actually, see, in Maryland, you can actually see the D.C. border from the gun shop. And we, have, we work through volunteer chapters. We have volunteer chapters, five of them in the D.C., or excuse me, in the, the Philadelphia area. We just started a new one in Chester, a city that's totally devastated by gun violence. And earlier this week, we had a group of people out in front of that, that gun shop. He closed because he knew we were going to be there. We're not trying to close these people down. We just want them to be good citizens. But he's not selling any guns this past Tuesday that are end, ending up on the streets of Chester. So I don't feel so bad about it. But those activities bring people out, people that get involved. And these are people that can begin to work towards a national for a movement for change in their communities and eventually larger than that. We also do what we call murder site witnesses. They're exactly what they sound like. We, sh we on Sunday afternoons, um, we come to a place where there's been a gun murder and we have an interface service. It lasts about 45 minutes. We pray, we sing, we, we, people walking by stop and say, what's going on here? And more often than not, they join with us. And when we start with a crowd of 25 or 30, by the end of it, we have 65 or 75. All people now understanding gun trafficking and willing to do something about it. And we just this year started a new thing we call Memorial, the Memorial to the Lost. Uh, we started at a church out in Chestnut Hill. We put a PVC pipe in the ground uh, and make teas with them and hang T-shirts on them with the names the date that they died and the age of all 288 Philadelphians who died in 2012. 288 seems like a high number, I'm sure you agree, but when it's on a page or I'm saying it, it's nothing like walking through 288 t-shirts lined up in it like a graveyard. And we get people who just are driving by and stop, turn around, come back and walk through, through our, our memorial. We move it around this, the city. It's been in five different locations, at churches and in a city park. And everywhere it goes, it creates inspiration and interest and commitment for change. So what I believe is we don't, it would be great if we all became single issue voters, as, as uh, Governor Rendell said, but I, I find that hard to believe. But I do believe that we can work together. The faith community can lead, but it takes every other constituency to join in. But that's how national social movements begin and how they, they're sustained. And I think we can begin it here in Philadelphia. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. I want to introduce uh, Dorothy Johnson Spite, who's the director and founder of Mothers in Charge. And I'd like you all to know that uh, for those of you who think that your work isn't making a difference, uh, on uh, January 1st, it was announced by the Philadelphia Inquirer that Dorothy was the Inquirer's Citizen of the Year for her work in gun violence prevention and with <laughs> advocacy for, for victims and survivors, and she has been a great partner. But it, we are making a difference. People are noticing. So, Dorothy, tell us what you're doing. Sure. Good afternoon, everyone. How many are moms and dads? Okay, quite a few of you. I am the mother of colleague Jabbar Johnson. He was 24 years old, my firstborn and my only son. Colleague was shot to death over a parking space um, in December of 2001. Since that day, I have committed my life to making a difference on the issue of gun violence. He was a graduate of the University of Maryland Eastern Shore, doing all the right things with his life, a fine young man, and ran into a very angry, out of control person who had a gun illegally. Um, in May of 2003, in fact, this May will be 11 years. I'm tired too, Brian. Um, 11 years, I started Mothers in Charge with a group of courageous women who had lost children to violence and decided that they wanted to be the voice for their children who speak no more. So for 11 years now, we have been on the front lines every single day working to address the issue of violence. We've had the pleasure of working with Shira Goodman. We go to Harrisburg with her. I remember the first time going to Harrisburg thinking like, why am I here? Why am I asking someone to uh, put in place legislation if a gun is lost or stolen that you reported? I mean, that to me was just common sense. 
you know, why wouldn't you report a gun if it's lost or stolen? Um, but we're still on that fight. We're still fighting for those kinds of common sense gun laws every single day, and I'm proud to be a partner with her on this fight. And as Kevin, uh, Deputy Commissioner Kevin Bethel mentioned, every single day we're working with the Philadelphia Police and Deputy Commissioner Ross in the back. Um, we have a commissioner that is very open to involving the community, working closely with the community. And these courageous women that I work with every single day are proud to be a part of this effort because, as I said, it gives our ch a voice to our children who speak no more, but it also empowers us that we can survive the pain of having to bury a son or daughter or a loved one because someone took a gun and took their life. It's a pain that never goes away. It's a pain that you wake up with. It's a pain that you go to bed with. And every single day at our office at 1415 North Broad, our phones ring off the hook for family members who've lost loved ones to senseless violence. And we do everything with those families. We support them in ways that I guess maybe only another person who's lost a loved one can do. But there are also women and, and folks that are part of our organization who haven't lost a loved one and don't want to. And that's why they support our work every single day. Um, I have a quick video, do I? Okay, I'd like to introduce you to Mothers in Charge. It's very short. It's um, a piece that was done by the early show. They came from New York and interviewed uh, Mothers in Charge about the work that we're doing and have been doing for the last 11 years. This is Mothers in Charge. From CBS News, it's the early show with Erica Hill and Chris Ragnar. Just ahead this morning, women who have lost children to unspeakable violence are determined now to help others avoid it. A pretty remarkable group of women. We're going to visit the group called Mothers in Charge when the early show comes back right here on CBS. Well, this week we're looking at the people and communities that help to find the American spirit. And this morning we profile a group of women in Philadelphia who suffer the greatest loss a mother can face. In a city where 85% of homicides are committed with a gun and more than 80% of them by African Americans between the ages of 15 and 34, these mothers are doing their best to make a difference, channeling their grief into community action. Do I have any volunteers? What we learned last week on one at this Philadelphia area foster home, concerned, compassionate moms are reaching out. We want you guys to really learn life on life terms. Teaching these kids about the consequences of violence. If you look at the numbers, it's the youth that's killing other youth. So I think it's important for us to go out and speak to them because we know firsthand what it's like for somebody to take something from you. You gotta always keep that hope alive. Dorothy Johnson Spite is the founder of Mothers in Charge, a Philadelphia-based advocacy and support group for families who've lost loved ones to violent crime. What prompted you to start this organization were the, f the families that are left behind. And their struggle each day to live after a tragedy like that. I think it's really making a difference in the life. Ten years ago, Dorothy's son, Colic, was gunned down over a parking space. Oh, he's kind of the wind beneath my wings that gets me going to think he would want me to try to save another mother from going through what we're going through. It's a sentiment and an inspiration shared by many of these mothers who also share the unthinkable pain of losing a child to violence. No one knows the attachment of a mother but a mother. I carried my son for nine months, but God gave him to me for 30 years. Out of their shared grief has grown a sisterhood of support and an increasingly important voice in the community. Some of the murders that we see in the city have a lot to do with retaliation. So oftentimes we get calls from mothers who give us information, you know, or will talk to us about a particular crime or something that's going on or concern they have in their community. In the hopes that you'll pass it on? In the hopes that we'll pass it on or come out and get involved, we do that. Which includes bringing inspiration to an unlikely place. How many of you ladies are mothers? At this Philadelphia prison, inmates are graduating from a program that teaches the virtues of good parenting. I am changing and I'm gonna get my life together again. 
if we can teach these women how to change the way they think, that they could change their behavior, thus reducing their, their, their recidivism in and out of prison, because if they're in prison, then who's raising their children? Now we have another child who's angry, another child who's going to be violent, another child who's going to pick up their gun. It can be a tough uh, mm -hmm. uh, part of the city. Their efforts have been recognized by law enforcement and by the city. They're doing work that, quite frankly, uh, the city government is really not necessarily in a position to do, and they do it with authority uh, because of who they are. Because of their success in the community, mothers in charge are now working with students at Villanova University to develop a national educational curriculum. So it's not just a Philadelphia problem with the violence, it's a problem across the country. But for all of the strength they find in one another and in their shared mission to end the senseless violence that took their children, the pain will never be far away. Is there ever a day when you wake up and you think, you know, I just, I'm, I'm not sure I can do this today. It's just, it's too hard for me without Khalid. I just don't know if I can. Many days, many days. But by the same token, he is what gets me up in the morning. And he gets you through. He gets me through. It's just an amazing group of women yeah. uh, led by Dorothy there. Um, as soon as they hear about a homicide, they immediately send a card yeah. trying to reach out to the family to bring them in because it does do so much for these families to know that they're not alone. Um, and, and a lot of the women were, were very generous in sharing their stories, yeah. share their stories with us. And we have a number of them at our website at earlyshow.cbsnews.com. So powerful, but so good to see them continuing to, to go on and do, these work, mm -hmm. do this work. It's a quote that it's kind of it stayed with me through many years. I heard it years ago. Dwight Eisenhower once said, there's no tragedy in life like the loss of a child. Things can never go back to the way they it's were. True. And it's good to see them moving on the best they can. Yeah. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Thank you. So we are on the front lines every day working uh, to make a difference. There are far too many guns in our communities across this country. Um, we have chapters of Mothers in Charge in San Francisco, LA, Kansas City, Atlantic City, New Jersey, and Delaware. Um, we are organizing across the country because it's not just a Philadelphia problem. Um, we've got to all come together. I never thought I'd have to bury my son. Um, and I just want to say that I don't think any one of us is safe until we're all safe. So we've got to all work together. We really do. It's not just a black problem or a white problem or anything like that. We've got to find ways to come together and address this issue of senseless violence that is tearing up communities across this country. Thank you. Let's start here. <clears throat> well, I think the ABA should be very pleased because I'm catching up time. But I am going to take a couple more of our minutes. So I'd like to, I know that, um, I know many of the folks in the audience, and I'm glad to see you, but I know the one question that they would have for each of the panelists is, what's one thing I can go home and do today? So, Dorothy, what would you ask, what would you ask the audience to do today? Think of a way that you can get involved. I think we all have gifts and talents that we have that we can lend to this effort, to this movement, um, whether you're a teacher or educator or social worker or just someone who has time, who's maybe retired and you have time that you can get involved. There are things that they can do by getting involved with ceasefire. You know, legislatively, there are things that you can do, writing letters. There's also mentoring of children that we need to help children know that they're loved and, and, not, and help them with their anger and things like that. The children that we have that are at risk oftentimes are victims and perpetrators of violence. So uh, we just got to find ways to get involved wherever we are. And it's something that each and every one of us can do. Brian, same question. I'd say to uh, any people of faith in the audience, to uh, take the message that you heard today and take it back to your church or your synagogue or your mosque. Every one of them, or almost every one of them, has some sort of witness, uh, mission, uh, social action, whatever committee. Those are perfect opportunities to get people involved in this issue. They're little groups that, that do actually do activism and get them to push it up through the church or the, the whatever the community of faith and then beyond that to the regional body of, of whatever faith that is as a way to get the, the faith community really involved in, in activism to prevent gun violence. Brian Lenz? Yeah, I would say one, one thing that I would recommend is to get uh, really smart about guns. I think one of the, the biggest uh, mistakes we make on this side of the argument is we don't learn the fundamental facts about the different types of guns, how they work. Uh, not asking you to be, you know, go to a range or become a gun nut, but when you're going to have these debates, one of the big, big things that I observed in the legisl at least in the legislative debate, is that oftentimes the people that are advocating 
for limits and restrictions don't have a complete understanding of the different types of guns, the different mechanisms, and it helps to be able to push back against the myths and the, and the, and the, and the falsehoods that the NRA pushes if, you're, if you educate yourself on that. Commissioner? I'll, I'll piggyback with what Dor Ms. Dorothy said, is, is just get involved. You know, I, I was, when I was a commander of the 17th District in South Philly, I met a young man in a fourth grade class and went to talk to him about uh, uh, guns, and we had a kid who had shot himself, and they asked him to come in and talk to him. And, uh, in that conversation, uh, this kid got up out of the room and walked away and was crying. Couldn't, didn't understand why. I followed him into the bathroom later on, and, and he talked about how two of his brothers were killed. And, and so I, I walked away from that environment saying, well, you know, I went back to the office and I said, wow, I got to do something here. I know I'm in the policing business, but what can I do as a man uh, for a young man who seemed to be in so much pain? And so I called back to the school, and seven years later, <laughs> you know, I don't have a son. I got three daughters, you know what I mean? But I have a young man who's... He was almost there. He's in 11th grade. He's a stellar student. Uh, he's a man of faith. Uh, he believes that he, you know, what he needs to be doing. He goes on vacation every day. Imagine taking a 12-year-old on vacation if you had never been to the ocean. Wow. Imagine that. You know, I sat there sometimes watching through the lens of a young man who sitting there running in the sand and in the water who had never really been to the ocean. And, and so you start to realize the impact. And it hasn't cost me one dime. You know, man, I don't, I mean, it doesn't cost me. I, mean, I have a son now who I love to death and who's made me more, a better person. And so I challenge folks who are, who are in, 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 in those positions, you don't know what you can do if, if, until you reach out and touch someone. That's right. You know, I mean, it, it does not get counted in the nightly stats. So you won't see that. I mean, you know, but what you do will get will, will be somebody who, you know, you can sit back later on and tap you on the shoulder and say, hey, you know, thank you. Um, you can sometimes you just can't find that you know, and so I, I every time I see somebody and I'm challenging my officers now to to make those positive contacts I mean you have to put a hand on someone you mean and you, you many of you have experience in here that goes well beyond your years uh, you know, I was a young man and my godfather was in a, in a cleaning business and I spent eight years in the cleaning business and he taught me the business and he and I couldn't understand why he'd make me to show up after work and he would never drive me to work. He'd make me walk and meet him at work. And, but he learned, he taught me so many things, so many life skills that I can never you know, repay him you know, today. And so I would challenge you to, to push out there and, and really get involved and, and really just take, take some effort to really touch someone that you know or some kid that you see out there who's struggling uh, because you can never, never imagine the difference you could make in their lives. Thank you. Um, at Ceasefire PA, we're so proud to be partnering with all these groups, and we also like to say that we'll meet anyone where they are. If they want to host us at their church or synagogue or mosque, we'll come. If they want to have a small gathering at their house with their neighbors and start talking about it, we'll be there. If you are ready to come to Harrisburg with us, we will be going back as soon as it gets a little warmer, and I can guarantee that my buses will go. We're going to go. Um, send an email, but we're ready Thank you. To, to take those first steps with you. Uh, we know that not everybody is going to be able to come up. I can't do it. What you know, the public health folks did, and and John Lowy and Julie. We, we can't all be those experts, but you don't have to be. You you have something better. You are a voter who lives in a district where somebody cares about it, and you can call them on the phone and say, I uh, I live in this district, and I want Representative Jones to know that I'm sick of the gun violence, and I want to change you know, X, Y, Z, our background check laws. I don't want it to be so easy to get guns. I want to know what you're doing about mental health. And that's all you have to do. And Brian can tell you as a former legislator that they write that down. Every call matters. Everything matters. You do not have to be an expert. You do not have to know all the facts. You, it, it comes from in here, like Dorothy and Brian talked about. And, and I know you all have that. And we at Ceasefire PA, at Heating God's Call, at Mothers in Charge, we want to meet you where you are. And if, if I'm not the right person, I'll send you to one of them, and they'll send you to me. And we do programs together so that we can um, make our members you know, fuller and broader participants in this. There's a couple Shira, questions. can I also add? Oh, please, yeah. Um, we have a, our second national conference coming up uh, in May, May 11th through the 14th at the Sheraton Hotel. It's called The Cost of Violence. There's some uh, flyers out on the table, so when you're leaving, grab one. This is also a way that you can get involved by su supporting our conference. We have workshops and presenters and a lot of educational presentations and forums that you'll learn more about how you can get involved to make a difference. Great, thank you. There's a couple audience questions. This one is for Brian Lentz. It says, I am one of those people who are ignorant about guns. Who might make a presentation to educate us? Are you suggesting that I just read? Where, where, that's a good question. Where, where can somebody go to learn that and not be intimidated and um, 
get good basic information that will help them be more effective? Well, I mean, you, uh, you, A, you can, you can do it by reading, uh, obviously hands-on, uh, to really get an understanding of how guns uh, operate and the different, you know, revolver, semi-automatic, bolt action, et cetera. Those are things that you need to, I think, be conversant in if you're going to be an advocate or arguing with the NRA. Uh, you can go to a gun store and, you know, they don't need to know that you're there for gun control. They'll show you all the guns because they think you're a customer. I'm sure Brian can tell you that. They'll, they'll put anything out there you want to see. You can go to a local rod and gun club, same thing. They will, they sometimes offer classes uh, uh, to people that they think are prospective members. Or if you have a friend or relative that happens to be familiar with guns uh, or is a gun owner, you can, you can do it that way. Um, those are some of, some of the ideas. I, I suppose you could go to the police department and ask them to give you a class on it. <laughs> I don't think that would happen. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> well, maybe we can yeah. and convince. Uh, yeah. I, I know some of you might not want to go to the gun store, or I've done it, or, or to the range, but maybe we can convince the police in different counties to do some programs with us that are more for people who just want to learn, not for people who want to get a concealed carry permit or have the safety training, but who just want to, to learn a little bit about the laws and, and about guns themselves. And, and I'm happy to look into that. Brian Miller, can you speak about the Sunday devoted uh, for all churches to mention gun violence? I think it's about gun violence Sabbath, maybe? Yeah, I probably should have mentioned that before. Um, the weekend of uh, two weekends from now, as a matter of fact, the weekend of uh, the 15th and 16th is uh, a National Gun Violence Prevention Sabbath weekend. Um, this is the second year um, it's being organized and uh, it's beginning to grow uh, and it's a good thing. There's, uh, there's a website, uh, GVP, I think Sabbath is the website, the organization, the main organization that's uh, behind it is called Faith United to Prevent Gun Violence. And what we seek to do in this is basically get, as I said before, get, get communities of faith to focus on the issue of gun violence. Every faith tradition has uh, the same thing, which is we are all responsible for our fellows. And uh, that's at heart um, where uh, the, the effort, uh, the faith community effort to, uh, to prevent gun violence, that's where it begins. So at that website, there are all sorts of resources um, in, uh, for different religions and, and faith traditions, including uh, prayers, hymns, um, and so on, as sermons, and so on. So uh, that's a good, really good resource, and we hope to build it each year so that it becomes uh, a truly national uh, uh, Sabbath weekend in the future. Thanks for that question, by the way. Here's two questions about straw purchasers. Um, so I think probably uh, Commissioner and both Brian's. One is, why aren't more straw purchasers prosecuted, and also how do you identify the gun dealers who are more likely to be selling to straw purchasers? <clears throat> sure. Uh, well, there actually there is a entire unit in the Philadelphia DA slash Attorney General's office devoted to prosecuting straw purchasers, so, so they are being prosecuted. Uh, Brian can tell you from his experience with, with different uh, gun shops um, how you can just sort of I think he would tell you from standing outside you can sort of see. Uh, whether a shop is really being uh, strict and who they sell to and who who not, uh, the in terms of guns that turn up in crime, you can track. You know, if one particular gun shop happens to be sort of a hot spot for having guns turn up in crime a short time after purchasing, uh, if you take the time to collect that data, you you can tell that. Uh, the main way that straw purchasing cases are prosecuted in Philadelphia are actually from tips from gun stores that are cooperative. So oftentimes, uh, they're oftentimes retired law enforcement guys work in the gun shops. And you know, the, the classic uh, stereotypical story is that the, the young lady who's four foot two comes in and, and requests a 50 caliber Desert Eagle. Uh, and when she's asked uh, what model, she looks at her phone and says, uh, uh, Gloak, uh, and he says, uh, <laughs> Uh, that usually tips them off that maybe she's not the actual buyer. And what they'll sometimes do is they'll delay the sale, notify the uh, agents, 
so that the agents can actually, in some cases, actually be behind the counter when she comes back to pick the gun up, and then they'll follow the purchaser to whoever the, the felon who organized that purchase. That's a typical fact pattern. Those are prosecuted, but they're not prosecuted in any huge numbers uh, because you only know about them, A, if you get that tip ahead of time, or B, if you recover the gun in a crime and there is some way to link it back to the fact that it was straw purchased. As Kevin said, most of the guns recovered are five, six years old. If they were straw purchased, it's almost impossible, virtually impossible to recreate that they were straw purchased six years prior because by the time they recovered, they'd been through two or three people and, and there's no way to trace it back to that original purchase. So let's, um, one final question for everybody is, this is the end of a long day, it's, you know, it's been kind of a little bit up and down emotionally. What's, you know, one thing you would say to, to keep people motivated, energized, that we will eventually have some success? Let's start with you, Commissioner. I often tell people that we, we sometimes we don't give ourselves enough credit. You know, we have made success. I mean, the strides that you hear in the, in the conversations that I heard in the back and the efforts are being put forth, I, I think sometimes we have to kind of take a, take a step back and say the work that we're doing, uh, the work that we will be doing uh, is the right place to be. Uh, and and I, I get up every day ready to go, and, and I'm sure most of you in this room do. You know, and I, I'm motivated by having, uh, living in the city and having three daughters and, and trying in my best to be in a position of a policymaker and, and, and deploying the, the assets across the city uh, that we are making a difference. And so I, so I, I would again just continue to, to, to tell you to, to, to keep pushing, that we are making strides, that we continue to have to chip away. Um, but I've seen how the city has evolved. I've seen you know, Center City evolve when it was, for those of you who knew Center City you know, 27 years ago and to see where it's at, you can see change can happen if people put their strengths and energies and direct it in the right place. Uh, change can happen. I've seen the changes at the DA's office. You know, I mean, when they, uh, you know, with different leadership and coming on and say we're going to be more engaged in what's going on and be more targeted and driven. And, and I see the activities, uh, you know, particularly with Ms. Uh, Ms. Dorothy and the work that they have done and the evolution of that program and, and the men and women and, and the women that I've come to know uh, through that program. So I, I just say continue to stay dedicated, continue to give accolades to yourself for the work you're doing with the understanding that, you know, if we drop the ball, then who do we pass it on to? You know what I mean? It has to be part of our legacy that, you know, someday sitting back in some corner somewhere, you're going to say all that work and effort you put forth did make a difference. Uh, and I think uh, we, can, we can make that happen. Yeah, I would, I would just echo uh, what Kevin said. You know, because of people like Kevin, uh, or Commissioner Bethel, because of people like him and the leaders in law enforcement, we're in sort of a golden age of law enforcement uh, with many of the uh, most cutting edge ideas about prevention and targeting and being data driven. Those are the reasons that, that they're seeing the dramatic reductions that, there's, that they got uh, in the past year. So there's real good news in the law enforcement community and the, and the prevention community and the impact that they're having on saving lives. Uh, on the legislative uh, agenda, you, you need a little more of a, a pep talk uh, because uh, certainly in Pennsylvania for the foreseeable future, it's pretty dim. Um, but uh, again, to echo what Commissioner Bethel said, we're right, they're wrong. And uh, sometimes it takes a long time for the right side to prevail, uh, but uh, in most cases throughout our history, eventually the right side prevails. So. I would say just keep making the arguments. This is, this is a generational thing when it comes to gun laws in the state of Pennsylvania, but we're, we'll get there, I'm, I'm confident. Well, as much as I'm tired of doing this work, I'm actually very optimistic. I'm optimistic, and I'm optimistic in Pennsylvania even. Um, I think uh, just demographics is, uh, is one big reason. It, when I was, when my father was a, was a, was growing up, uh, it was very typical for fathers and sons to go hunting. Now I have no no difficulty with hunting, and neither does heeding God's call. But, but it was creating the market for the National Rifle Association, if you will. When I was a kid, my father took me hunting, but he hated it. And I don't take my son hunting. I never would. And my 27-year-old son and his friends, they're not interested in hunting. And we've seen 
the hunting community in the United States dropped dramatically, and that's why the gun companies are, have started selling guns on making them look military to, and matching them with, uh, with video games and so on. But I think the NRA's market is, is, is shrinking constantly and dramatically over time so that the people who support them become a smaller and smaller part of the, part of the population. And I know my 27-year-old son and his friends, they have no interest in guns, and that generation is, is really interested in gun violence prevention, I believe. So when I talked about the National Social Movement, it may sound a little uh, dreamlike, but I don't think it is, because I think that younger generation is, in fact, going to lead it in the near future, and that's going to bring change completely across the country. And in Pennsylvania itself, I think that finally, you know, Pennsylvania had no gun violence prevention organizations until very recently, but now we do have organizations. We have organizations up here, we have Delco United and many other local organizations that have, that have sprung up. And I think what we're going to see is they're going to work together to build campaigns. And it's campaigns that change things electorally and legislatively. And I'm really excited that we're going to be part of that, and I think we're going to bring major change in Pennsylvania. Not, not in 20 years, but far shorter than that. So I think it's a good time. I agree, Brian. Um, I think that you've got to stand for the right thing, and, and right will prevail. Um, it's difficult sometimes when we get the news reports, 6 o'clock in the evening, you're watching the news. But I think we are a part of a movement that is going to change, you know, the way that things are. And um, I have a four-year-old grandson who's named after my son, colleague. And um, I might not be around to see when he's 22, 23, or 24, but I will know that I've made a difference, you know, um, not only for him, but for your grandchildren as well, or your children, um, that maybe they'll be a lot safer in the city of Philadelphia and surrounding areas because of the work that we're doing. Well, thank you. And I would just ask you all, please, you know, get involved, stay involved, stay heartened, sign up for our emails, sign up with Dorothy and Brian, come to something. And we're supposed to have a nice weekend this weekend. So that means, you know, that means it means politicians are going to be knocking on your doors because they need their petition signatures. I've been hearing a lot of them complaining that they're behind. Ask them. They, they're coming to ask you for something. Ask them, where do you stand on this? What are you going to do? How are you going to break the logjam in Harrisburg? That is easy. It is your right. It's your First Amendment right. That's number one in the Bill of Rights, right? <laughs> so please do that. I want to thank the ABA, President yes. Silkenot, David Clark, all the panelists. I think they're going to come back up, but you've been a terrific audience. I'm so proud that we did this in Philadelphia, so thank you.